Welcome everybody to uh, this week's Lunch and Learn. We're going to continue in our approach to uh, acid-base disorders. And again, just to refresh your memories as far as terminology and what we're typically analyzing, uh, the top line shows the carbonated species that are in blood and the equilibrium between them. So there's carbon dioxide and water, which form carbonic acid. The carbonic acid can break down into a proton and bicarbonate, and the bicarbonate can further break down into another proton and carbonate. Now, as far as the concentrations of these things, bicarbonate is the most prevalent. It's in the millimolar range, whereas carbonic acid and carbonate are in the micromolar range. And so we don't talk about them clinically, both for reasons that we don't need them and also because their concentrations are low. Carbon dioxide, uh, when it's dissolved in blood, also is in the millimolar range. And remember, it's 0.03, the solubility coefficient of carbon dioxide, times the PCO2. So normally it's 40 in a male times 0.03, which would be 1.2 millimolar. And so we can get something called the total CO2, which re represents the total concentration of all these four carbonated species, carbon dioxide that's dissolved, carbonic acid, bicarbonate, and carbonate. And that's what you get back uh, when you get back the chemistry from blood. We get the, what's called the total CO2. So again, please do not call that bicarbonate. And please do not call it CO2. It's the total CO2 content of, of blood. Now, that is not a precise term because we're saying total CO2. It really should have another term, maybe the total carbonated species or something. That's what evolved. But just so you know, that's what it represents. It's the sum of all of them. And we only care about the, the bicarbonate, which is the majority of it, and the dissolved CO2, as I mentioned. So if this is, let's say, 26 25 will have come millimoles per liter will have come from bicarbonate and another one, approximately one millimole per liter will have come from carbon dioxide. So you can see this can change either because the bicarbonate changed or the dissolved carbon dioxide changed. And normally it's mostly because this changed because this is you know, only one millimole per liter at a PCO2 of 40. Remember the uh, this equation where the hydrogen ion concentration equals 24, which is a constant and never changes under physiologic conditions, times the PCO2 over bicarbonate. This equation, which I didn't say before, but you need to remember, applies whether you have an acid-base disorder or not. The right side must always equal the left side. Doesn't matter what the numbers are. You can have normality or any acid-base disorder or any combination of acid-base disorders. The PCO2 is a reflection of pulmonary function, and the bicarbonate is a reflection of what the kidneys are doing. And these would be the typical numbers in, in a male. Uh, that should be actually 20. Some people say 24, some people say 25. It really doesn't change the hydrogen ion concentration significantly. Okay, so again, we're going to skip the rest of the physiologic background that keeps those numbers what they are. And we're going to now go to the concept of how do you clinically diagnose abnormalities in acid-based parameters. And again, it's confusing because you could be looking at the pH. You could be looking at the total CO2 that you typically get from venous blood. You could be looking at the PCO2 on the blood gas, or you could be looking at the calculated bicarbonate. What you should be looking at is the either the total CO2, which I said a minute ago represents bicarbonate essentially, or the bicarbonate itself if you happen to have a blood gas. Remember the bicarbonate's calculated from the blood gas and it's it knows the equation I just showed and what's measured is the pH and the PCO2. So there's a pH electrode, a PCO2 electrode. There is no bicarbonate electrode. It's calculated uh, by the blood gas machine and it's a valid number. Some people think because it's calculated, that means it has a lower status in life. And that's not true. As long as the pH and the, bicarb and the PCO2 were measured correctly, then the bicarbonate is a perfect number. And so um, you can use that if you have it or use the total CO2. And you ask your mind the question, is the number normal, increased, or decreased? 
If it's decreased, you have a choice of three acid-base disorders. And you distinguish these not by what the bicarbonate is, because it can be low in all of these things. Now, granted, in acute respiratory alkalosis, it doesn't get that low I mean, when you do the math, because it depends how low the PCO2 drops. It falls in response to that. And the response is for every 10 fall on the PCO2, the bicarbonate falls two, or if for every five fall on the PCO2, the bicarbonate falls one. So you can see that if the PCO2 falls from 40 to 10, the most this could fall would be by three, roughly. The bicarbonate would be, instead of 25, it would be 22. Can't get, even if the PCO2 fell from 40 to zero, acutely, the most the bicarbonate could fall would be by, you know, would be four times that. So um, if the PCO2 fell by, let's say, 40, uh, the bicarbonate would fall by four times two. So it it really can't go as low as it can go in these acid-based disorders. But the bottom line is it can fall, and that the fact that it fell doesn't mean you have a metabolic acidosis, like a medical student or resident would think. You have to think of these respiratory acid-based disorders too, and we divide it up into acute or chronic just because the bicarbonate, if you keep the PCO2 down, falls e e even further. And knowing the, the three rules, again, you can remember the Winters formula if you want for this. I just find it far simpler to remember that for every 1.2 fall on the bicarbonate as the initiating event, you increase your ventilation such that the PCO2 falls roughly by the same amount. So if the bicarbonate fell from 25 to 15 in ketoacidosis, you'd expect that the PCO2 would approximately fall from 40 to 30 maybe a little bit less because it's 1.2 to 1. But again, these are just population means. A given patient, maybe 1.1 to 1 or 1 to 1. This is just an average. There is, you know, a standard deviation between people, and you can look up the original papers if you want. That's why it's all so hard. People try to get too precise and say, well, it wasn't this, so do they have another acid-base disorder? You really should look up the papers and know what the standard error is in these rules. And only when it's outside that two standard deviations do you start thinking of another acid-base disorder. So this is one possibility that the bicarbonate's down. The other possibility is it's increased. And again, there's three reasons. And again, they have three different rules that you need to memorize. And you see which of the three scenarios your patient fits into. And again, if it's not one of the first three or the second three, then you have a mixed disorder. But again, Remember, these are averages and you have to be outside them. And it's always sort of an argument on the ward. Is there another acid-base disorder? My patient didn't fit exactly the rule. And the answer is you need to have a feeling of what the standard uh, error is, standard deviation. I mean, no attending remembers that. You might want to look up the papers and I can help you with those if, if, if uh, you find it hard to do. So again, we don't look at the pH. We don't look at the PCO2. We zero in on the bicarbonate or the total CO2 if you don't have blood gases. But again, if you don't have blood gases, you can't make an acid-base diagnosis because just knowing what the bicarbonate changed by is not enough. You need to know what the PCO2 changed by in all six scenarios. So you cannot make an acid-base diagnosis without knowing what the PCO2 is in addition. Okay, so we again, we have two types for each of these, metabolic acidosis, we divide up by anion gap. Alkalosis, we divide up by chloride sensitivity. Respiratory acidosis, we divide up by time. Respiratory alkalosis, we divide up by time. So it's not sufficient for you to write tomorrow that your patient has a respiratory acidosis on the chart. You have to write, is it acute or chronic respiratory acidosis? And it's not sufficient to write, my patient has a metabolic alkalosis. You have to write, is it chloride resistant or sensitive based on the either fractional excretion of chloride in the urine or the urine chloride concentration with the provisos I mentioned last week. If you're assessing concentration, you always have to remember that it's not just dependent on the amount of chloride in the urine. It's dependent on how much water the patient drinks and you can be fooled. Okay, so here's a patient. It's a 60 year old male and uh, you can see the total CO2 here is 36. 
and the patient might have a little bit of CKD, unclear, or AKI. We don't know how long this has been going on. And we got blood gases, and we find that the pH is 7.29, the PCO2 is 70, the calculated bicarbonate is 34, and the PO2 is 50. Now, remember, when you get blood gases, you should always calculate the A grading because as we'll show, the A grading gives you additional information as to whether you have parenchymal lung disease or a VQ abnormality or a shunt, you always should do that. And the A grading, remember, on room air is 150 millimeters of mercury minus five quarters of what the PCO2 is. And what this gives you is the PO2 in the lungs or the PO2 in the alveoli. And then you subtract from that the PO2 in the blood and you get what's called the A grading. And it should be around 10, that sort of range. If it's 20 or 30 or 40, you know there's something going on in the lungs. So this patient has a normal AA gradient. And therefore, you also know that is it isn't sufficient to say that. You also know that the low PO2 in the blood is because of a low PO2 in the alveoli. And the reason for the low PO2 in the alveoli is because the PCO2 is much higher than normal. Remember, you can only have a, a total pressure that's, you know, 150, uh, well, 150 uh, millimeters of mercury in the, but in, in atmospheric pressure, there's 760 millimeters of mercury, roughly. Um, where we are, we're not exactly at sea level. You subtract from that 47 millimeters of mercury from water, and you're left with 713 millimeters of pressure. And then you multiply that by the percent of the total air that oxygen occupies, and it's 21%. So that's where you get the 150 from. It's 20, 21% of 713. It won't be 21% if you're breathing oxygen, but assuming you're breathing just air itself, you'll get an answer 150. But that's not the um, only made up of oxygen. It's a made up of oxygen, it's made up of nitrogen, and there's some carbon dioxide in the lung too. So what you can do to get what the PO2 is in the in the alveoli is, is to subtract five quarters. Where this equation comes from, I won't get into now, but you can subtract five quarters times the PCO2. If it was 40, you can see it would be five quarters of 40, which would be a PO2 in the alveoli of about 100. So it's 150 millimeters of mercury in the air, and it's 100 in the alveoli normally. So even if you had a normal A gradient, if it's 100 in the alveoli, the most your PO2 in your blood would be would be 90, 90 something. And conversely, if the PCO2 is below 40, you can see that the PO2 in the alveoli will be above 100. Let's say you, you have a chronic respiratory alkalosis or an acute respiratory alkalosis, it doesn't matter. Let's say your PCO2 is 20, it would be five quarters of 20. The PO2 in your alveoli would be 125. And because you have normal lungs and a normal A grading, 125 minus 10 would be your PO2 would go up to 115 in your blood. So it's important because changes in the PCO2 also affect the PO2. And you just you shouldn't separate them conceptually. Um, they, are, they are different physiologically, but you should, be, you should get into the habit of always assessing the A gradient uh, with the information you're given on the blood gases. So... Getting back to the acid base, we can either look at the total CO2 or the calculated bicarbonate. We can also confirm that the total CO2 is correct because, again, it's the sum of four things, but two of them are in the micromolar range, so we can ignore it. The total CO2 should be equal to the bicarbonate plus 0.03 times the PCO2. So if we take 34, plus 0.03 times 70, we get about two point something. So this should be around 36, or this should be 36. You can see it is. And it's not only one different because here we have more of the total CO2 in the blood because the PCO2 is increased. So it's not just one above the bicarbonate. We have a higher PCO2. We have more dissolved CO2 in the patient's blood, more dissolved carbon dioxide. And if you if you check these numbers, if you turn this into hydrogen ion concentration, if you feel like doing that, you'll see that it fits the previous equation. It fits this equation. 
you plug the numbers in. You should do that anyway routinely just to get used to doing it. Okay, so the question then is we have a high bicarbonate. Does anyone want to unmute and tell me what the three choices are, what the three possible acid-base diagnoses are? So again, it's decreased choice of three, increased choice of three. Anyone? Nothing fancy here. Just what are the three acid-base disorders that can raise the bicarbonate or the total CO2? Anyone? Uh, I think you're muted, Apoorva. Oops, sorry. No, go ahead. You could have respiratory, chronic respiratory acidosis with okay. metabolic compensation. Yeah, we don't use the word remember. Oh, okay. Acid-base disorders that are respiratory, we just say acute or chronic. Right. Chronic implies that the kidney has done what it's going to do. So just remember, and then again, it doesn't make sense. You just have to memorize it. We we only use the word compensation in the metabolic acidosis, uh, acid-base disorders. So yes, you're right. It could be chronic respiratory acidosis, which which means compensated. When you, as soon as you say chronic, you're saying the kidney has raised the bicarbonate to the predicted value. So that's correct. What else could it be? Again, there's three choices always. It becomes pretty brainless after a while. Anyone? You also have an acute respiratory. With yes, it could be. It could be acute. Process. Okay, so again, the term is just acute respiratory acidosis. We don't. You don't say any more than that. So again, the terminology is for respiratory acid-based disorders. You just say acute or chronic. You don't. You don't say any more than that. You're you're already telling another human being what's going on when you say that. So it's it's acute respiratory acidosis can raise the bicarbonate. Chronic respiratory acidosis can raise the bicarbonate. And what's the third reason for an elevated bicarbonate? Metabolic alkalosis. Yes. So it's either metabolic alkalosis or acute or chronic respiratory acidosis. I mean, after we do a number of these, you're going to get sick of saying it. But but that's the three. So now the question is, which of the three is it? And again, we look at the change in bicarbonate from its original level, and we compare it to the change in the PCO2 from its original level. So let's start off with the first thing that was said, and that would be chronic respiratory acidosis. Typically, you would I mean, you just get used to it. You just say acute first. I mean, there's no rationale for it. Um, you just say acute respiratory acidosis, chronic respiratory acidosis, metabolic alkalosis, if you're going to talk about the respiratory first. So let's let's flip everything and just, I would just typically memorize the order. Let's The most common reason for this would not be a respiratory acid-based disorder, acute or chronic. It would be metabolic alkalosis by far if you just looked at a thousand patients. Metabolic alkalosis would be the most. So let's do that first. So this could be metabolic alkalosis. So again, we look at the change in bicarbonate from normality and compare it to the change in the PCO2, and we see if it fits the metabolic alkalosis rule. And remember, for every 10 increase in the bicarbonate, you get this secondary change in the PCO2 where your ventilation decreases such that the PCO2 increases 7 tenths or whatever the bicarbonate went up. So if the bicarbonate, if this is a male, let's say the bicarbonate started at 25, it went up by nine, you'd expect the PCO2 to go up seven tenths of nine. So it should go up about 6.3. Should be like, if it started at 40, it would be 46. So clearly we don't have that. We would expect to see a bicarb of 34 and a PCO2 of 36, 37, or 46, 47. Uh, and it's clearly not that. So this cannot be a compensated metabolic alkalosis. So we go to choice two. Could this be an acute respiratory acidosis? Well, there it's the PCO2, which is the driver. So we say for every 10 increase in the PCO2, the bicarbonate goes up a further two. And that, by the way, let me just go back. That has nothing to do with the human body. Okay, that has nothing to do with the human body. That's solely this reaction here. It's the, again, when the PCO2 goes up, you generate bicarbonate. Now that confuses people. They go, well, isn't a proton also generated? Why does anything happen? Well, the, what happens is these protons bind to other buffers. So you'll generate two bicarbonates and, or two millimoles per, for every 10 
increase in this, the bicarbonate will go up two millimoles per liter. Yes, the proton concentration, if there were no other buffers, would also go up two millimoles per liter. I mean, your pH would be zero. But the point is the protons bind to other buffers. And so the hyd free hydrogen ion concentration changes very little. And you can do the math with the equation for if this goes to 50 and this goes from 25 to 27, you can calculate what the H will be. It goes up, you know, a few nanomolar. And that's because even though they were generated equally, this doesn't, the bicarbonate doesn't bind to anything. It goes free into solution. This guy goes binding to other buffers like phosphate, albumin, hemoglobin. I mean, there's a ton of buffers in the DNA. There's a lot of different amino acids. So the, the free concentration, which is what determines the pH, not the total amount that we generated, but the free changes in very, very little in the nano, by, nan, by nanomolar amounts compared to what this changes by. That, that confuses people when they look at this. But remember, this goes free, this doesn't, even though they're made equally. So when we have acute respiratory acidosis, you just need the bicarbonate buffers in solution in the extracellular fluid in the cells. You don't need a kidney, anything else. Nothing else affects this. And so this went up by roughly 30 if it started it. So this should go up by three times two, which would be six. And you can see it doesn't. So um, you can see uh, that this cannot be acute respiratory acidosis. Now, could it be chronic respiratory acidosis. Well, remember, for every 10 increase in the PCO2 chronically, this goes up about 3.5. At least that was the old teaching. Some people think it goes up by a full five. So it's like two to one. Uh, for every two increase in this, this increases by one. Or for every 10 increase in the PCO2, this goes up by, by five. But the people, it's in the textbooks and what you're taught is still for every 10 increase in the PCO2 chronically, the bicarbonate will go up a total of three and a half. Remember the first one and a half or two was from the bicarbonate buffer system in blood and in cells. It has nothing to do with, the reason it goes up further to, to, to a total of three and a half is the kidney starts generating and reclaiming more bicarbonate. We'll talk about that another day. But for this, you need a kidney for the, for the increase that you see chronically with respiratory acidosis. If you have someone with ESRD with no renal function, this will, it will not go up a total of three and a half for every 10 increase in the PCO2. It'll always look acute. So the question is, could this be chronic respiratory acidosis? Well, this went up by 30 or so, which would, remember for every 10, it goes up three and a half. So it should be roughly three times three and a half, which is around nine or 10. And it is, you can see that these numbers fit chronic respiratory acidosis. And again, uh, as you may recall, we don't look at the pH and we haven't looked at the pH here either. Uh, and we're just looking at the changes in these two numbers here and we're able to make a diagnosis. So these numbers best fit chronic respiratory acidosis. Okay. Now remember chronic respiratory acidosis takes time to, to be defined as such. So if you step change the PCO2, so this is a step change from and let's say in this particular case from 40 to 70, and we keep it there, we're not changing anything here, we get this time-dependent increase in bicarbonate or total CO2 if we follow the patient. The first jump here is just non-organ uh, created. It's the bicarbonate buffer reaction. We're generating more bicarbonate. Yes, we do generate more protons, but they the, the vast majority of them bind buffers, and we don't see their concentration increase uh, significantly. But if we keep the PCO2 at the same level, we are not changing the PCO2, the bicarbonate continues to go up, and this requires a kidney. This whole phenomenon of this increasing concentration until after four or five days a new steady state is achieved, we call it a steady state. What we mean by that is it stops changing. It doesn't go down again, it just stays at this new plateaued level. We call it at this point, chronic respiratory acidosis. We do not call it compensated. So do not use the word compensated. And again, it doesn't make sense. We could do that. It just did that term didn't evolve. And so it's best just to know the, the terminology and the uses that 
that has been accepted. And yes, you will hear attendings and fellows and have 50 million words, but just plug your ears, you know, just have use the accepted terminology and then you'll be um, conveying the information in, in the appropriate and sophisticated way. We do not have a term for anything in between. Now we could, we could call this subacute, sub subacute, because it's obviously a continuum. It just didn't evolve that way. We have a term for the beginning and we have a term for the final steady state that we call chronic respiratory acidosis. When you're saying that to someone, you're telling them that the patient's blood follows the chronic respiratory acidosis rule. Now, obviously, prior to achieving that new steady state, the bicarbonate will not have increased sufficiently to have the rule um, appropriate. And so if you come here, it'll look mixed. It'll look like it's something between acute respiratory acidosis, which will fit the rule of 10 to two or five to one. And here, it will fit the rule of chronic respiratory acidosis of 10 to three and a half as far as the deltas. But in between, it'll be somewhere in between that. And so you can be fooled if you don't wait long enough. And oftentimes clinically, you don't know how long it's been going on. So don't get fooled into call something mixed just because it doesn't fit. It may be that you're in between the initial part of the event and then reaching a new steady state. Always keep that in mind because the final bicarbonate steady state in acute in rest in chronic respiratory acidosis and also respiratory alkalosis takes a few days whereas opposed to in metabolic acidosis and alkalosis where you have the bicarbonate fall as the initiating event and now the pco2 the ventilation is what's changing secondarily that we call compensation that occurs within within minutes you know to maybe a couple hours it's not going to take days Okay, so remember this time course, we have two names, the initiating event, which is very fast, that bicarbonate buffer reaction occurs in minutes, seconds to minutes. Now, remember that when we have uh, a patient that we say COPD, chronic lung disease, you can divide those patients up by both their pathophysiology and also the acid base diagnosis you'd expect. If you see chronic respiratory acidosis, then you know you're dealing with what's, you know, medical school they teach you, it's called a blue bloater or someone with chronic bronchitis. As opposed to someone who also has COPD, but who has a chronic respiratory alkalosis and they have emphysema or they're called a pink puffer. So remember that that the acid-based diagnosis also tells you the underlying pulmonary pathophys pathophysiology. If you have a chronic respiratory acidosis, you do not have someone with emphysema. You don't have to do a chest X-ray. You, you know that a priori, unless there's some combined you know, physiology or pathology going on in the lung. But if you just take the two bookends, if you have chronic respiratory acidosis, you know without doing anything you're dealing with and it's chronic and they have chronic lung disease, you know you're dealing with chronic bronchitis. Whereas opposed to someone who's chronically hyperventilating, who has chronic respiratory alkalosis, they do not have chronic bronchitis. So you should get used to thinking in these terms. So you'll have clarity conceptually and you won't you sort of have foggy thinking, mixing all these things up with each other. And you also won't be doing inappropriate tests that you don't need to do. These patients, remember, have a normal AA gradient. The chronic respiratory acidosis patient who has pure ventilation problems with normal lung parenchyma has hypoxia, yes, but it's because the PO2 in their lung in their alveoli are too low because their PCO2 is too high. These patients actually have a have a high PO2 in their lungs. Their P, their PCO2 is below normality. So if you calculate, um, you know, 150 minus five quarters of their PCO2 their alveolar PO2 is going to be in, in the in the hundreds. It's going to be above normal, and yet they're hypoxic, which means they must have some you know parenchymal lung problem or a VQ abnormality or a, a shunt. But you know there's going to be something most likely you're going to see on chest X-ray. Okay, here's another patient. Uh, this patient is again an elderly male with shortness of breath and bone pain. When you hear that and you see, forget the acid-base disorder even, when you see CKD and you see anemia 
and you see hypercalcemia, what's your number one diagnosis without doing anything? Pretend this patient walked into the ER or the clinic today. Anybody? What's the number one diagnosis by far? Multiple myeloma. So if you see any patient who's in their 70s or 80s with CKD or AK, it's really AKI, uh, and anemia and hypercalcemia, you, you have multiple myeloma until proven otherwise. So that's just sort of just an aside. This patient also had what looks like the same numbers. Basically, this patient has chronic respiratory acidosis too. This does not fit. It's the same thinking, so I, we don't need to repeat it. Numbers are the same as the last patient. I just wanted to bring that up because these patients often are more complex and they have not just the acid-base disorder, obviously, but they have other medical issues. And throughout your fellowship, you're going to, intermittently see this and a light should click off every time you see it uh, even if they were anemic without the hypercalcemia if they have bone pain and they have aki and they have anemia that's multiple myeloma until proven otherwise in an older person yes they could have other causes of aki like you know it could be pre-renal you go through the same thinking could be cardiac um, it could be obstructive prostate etc but if they have the bone pain and the anemia you're thinking multiple myeloma until proven otherwise. Okay, so same thinking in this patient. It's basically no different than the last case. Okay, here's the last case. It's a 24-year-old female in the third trimester. And you look at her numbers, and she's got a low total CO2. Bicarbonate is compatible with that. The PCO2 is also down. And so again, what are the possibilities? Well, you look at the total CO2 or the bicarbonate and it's down. So again, same sort of repetitive thinking. What are the three reasons, three acid-base disorders that lower the total CO2 or bicarbonate? Anyone? Yep, go ahead, Terry. Uh, <clears throat> we have metabolic acidosis. Very good. So this could be a metabolic acidosis. That's it. And then uh, chronic or acute respiratory alkalosis. Very good. So that's it. it. Becomes brainless after a while. So this is this is either there's only three, and these and the three that were mentioned are correct. Very good. So again, you don't know which of the three it is. You look at the change in bicarbonate from normality and compare it to the change in PCO2 from normality. So if this was metabolic acidosis, the drop in PCO2 as a compensatory ventilatory response gives you a new PCO2 that's roughly dropped by whatever the bicarb fill. Um, 1.2 to 1 or the Winters formula, which is more complicated, which has an intercept in it also. So that's, I just, I just don't use it. And it's not needed. It doesn't give you any more accuracy. Uh, so it's roughly 1 to 1. So the bicarb, uh, this is a female, remember. So the bicarb isn't likely starting at 25. It's probably 23 or 24 at the most. So it fell by nine or 10 and the PCO2 doesn't start at 40, it's likely 38, so it fell by, eight. this is roughly one to one, um, you would say if it was 30, but the PCO2 didn't fall one to one, it fell by twice what the bicarbonate fell. So we'll go now, in, it cannot be a compensated metabolic uh, acidosis. So now we're left with acute or chronic respiratory alkalosis. Could it be acute respiratory alkalosis? Well, remember, if your PCO2 falls suddenly by 20, roughly, your bicarbonate should fall by about four. Remember, it's 10 to two. And the bicarbonate did not fall by four. It fell by about 10. So this is not compatible with acute hyperventilation. Could it be chronic hyperventilation? Well, the rule is two to one or 10 to five, whatever you like to use. For every 10 fall on the PCO2, the bicarb falls five or half of that. And these numbers fit. The PCO2 fell twice with the bicarb fell. So this is one of the three. It's not a mixed disorder, and it's compatible with chronic respiratory alkalosis, and that's what you would pick on an exam or in the real world if this was a patient. The pH is 747 just from the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation. It can't be anything else with, the, with the, that PCO2 and bicarbonate. Okay, so... Um, we look at the other numbers. The patient also has some dysneutremia. We don't 
expect that typically in the third trimester. There might be something else going on. Uh, we won't focus on that uh, right now. Um, and the anion gap's normal too. So that again would be, I mean, if it is, met, if you put metabolic acidosis down, at least you'd be wrong, but at least you would say, if you were wrong, you you should pick a non-gap metabolic acidosis. But you, again, you shouldn't be picking that altogether. Um, okay, so this is chronic respiratory alkalosis. It's probably, if you look at the planet, the most common acid-base disorder on the earth, just because the fact of the fact that every woman in the third trimester of pregnancy has has numbers like these. Maybe a little bit better. The PCO2 may be 25, 26. But if you just took the entire Earth's population and said and asked the question, what's the most common acid-base disorder? Your answer must be chronic respiratory alkalosis. Number one, because that's what you see in pregnant women. And number two, everyone who lives at high altitude has this. So you go to Denver, Colorado. Anyone who lives, you know, two, 3,000 feet up is going to have a significant respiratory alkalosis because of hypoxia driving the ventilation. So when you work in these renal divisions as a renal fellow, um, these fellows don't see normal numbers ever in normal people. So if you live at high altitude and you're pregnant, you're going to have an even lower PCO2. So just keep in mind, that's the most common acid-base disorder. At UCLA, we see a lot of it just because that's the most common acid-base disorder in end-stage liver disease. And it, just pathophysiologically, you have to always ask yourself, what's driving the ventilation? Hypoxia, yes, that's sort of the easy one at high altitude. In pregnancy, it's not really well understood. People think progesterone can drive the medulla. And that's also the answer given in end-stage liver disease that they have a high progesterone level driving the ventilation. It's not been well worked out, but that would be the answer you get you give on a test. So again, we have two phenomena occurring when we increase the PCO2 or decrease the PCO2. We have first of all the bicarbonate buffer reaction, which is the acute phenomena. Now we're lowering the PCO2, so we drive the reaction this way and we consume bicarbonate. That's where we get the 10 to two rule from. For every 10 fall on this, this falls by two. And again, this confuses people because they say, well, don't you consume an equal amount of protons? Yes, you do consume two millimoles per liter of protons, but the buffers that have protons on them suddenly release the protons. The opposite occurs. So this hardly changes, even though this changes by two millimoles per liter. If you didn't have any buffers, this would also change by two millimoles per liter and your pH will be 14. Because remember, this is in the nanomolar range when, when the pH is 7.4, this is 40 nanomoles per liter. If this changed by millimoles per liter, your pH would be you know, the highest it can be. So obviously that doesn't occur physiologically. And it's because as soon as this starts to drop because of its consumption in this reaction, making carbon dioxide, other buffers like albumin, DNA, amino acids, phosphate, they all release the protons and keep it roughly in the same concentration range. So getting back to our patient, we get the opposite occurring. If we have a woman, um, in, in, obviously it doesn't occur in a step change in the third trimester. It's gradually decreasing. You just reach the maximum in the third trimester. But this would be someone, let's say, who I suddenly ventilated too much and I dropped the PCO2 from 40 to, let's say, 20 and keep it there. I would get this temporal change in bicarbonate, which again, takes a number of days to reach a new steady state. This sudden fall is the bicarbonate buffer equilibrium that I showed a minute ago. And then the further fall is the kidney. So if you have ESRD, it stays here at this high level. It doesn't keep falling. Why it falls is complicated. There's changes in net acid excretion. Um, there's some bicarbonate excretion that's and it seems to differ in humans and dogs. And we'll talk about that, the mechanism of this fall another time. But the point is that for every 10 fall on this, this falls by five, or 20 fall on this, this falls by 10, or 30 fall on this, this falls by 15. Bottom line is it's two to one. Whereas if these numbers were both down equally, that would be a compensated metabolic uh, acidosis. So you can recognize this right away. You just look at the change in PCO2, change in bicarb, if it's two to one, you don't have to think it's res chronic respiratory alkalosis if they're both down. And we'll show this next week, but this is 
would be what you see in someone who's anxious. Again, you have a drop in the PCO2, but the bicarb has only changed a little bit because it's too soon to have the kidneys kick in. But you would see this chronically in ESRD and you can be fooled. So be careful. So I think I'll stop there today. And anyone who has any questions about anything I said, please, uh, please unmute, let me know. Yes. You know, I've always, I've always memorized the numbers, but I don't really, I never really understood why in alkalosis that the delta change in the bicarb relative to the PCO2 is not the same numerical numbers as in acidosis. I, I, I don't want to belay the lecture. I'm just kind of curious as to why is it like one and 3.5 and two and five? Why, if it's just shifting back and forth along the equation. Okay. Could you say but, your question again? I'm not sure I understood. I, I'm just wondering, you know, like anecdotally, why is it that we have observed that in our respiratory alkalosis or in acute or chronic respiratory alkalosis, the change in the bicarb relative to the, the 10 units of PCO2 numerically is different than that in acidosis? Well, in acute, kind of in acute respiratory acidosis and acute respiratory alkalosis, the changes are equal. They're just opposite in direction. So if I raise your PCO2, your bicarb will go up two for every 10 increase in the PCO2. It's the it's the same equation in the acute respiratory acidosis and alkalosis. For every 10 change in the PCO2, the bicarb changes by two. The further change in both is because the kidneys do things that additionally change the steady state bicarbonate concentration. It has nothing to do with the uh, equation. That's a phenomenon of either generating more bicarbonate and re reabsorbing it to add additional bicarbonate to the blood above what was generated by raising the PCO2 acutely, or in respiratory alkalosis, the kidney decreases the bicarbonate concentration further beyond the two change for every 10. But in acute respiratory acidosis and alkalosis, the change in bicarbonate is identical it's two for every 10 change in the PCO2. This, the directions are different. One is bicarbonate goes up and in, in, in response to the PCO2 going up and the other, the bicarbonate goes down in response to the PCO2 going down. But numerically they're identical, which you would expect a priori because you're just talking about the solution in your cells and in your extracellular fluid. And there's no organ involved with that. I don't know, did that answer your question or did I not understand what you were? No, no, you did. You did. It sounds like the reason why we see a difference in the chronic states is just... Oh, there's why there's a difference, difference in the chronic state in respiratory alkalosis versus acidosis. If that's your question, why in alkalosis for every 10, it changes by 5, and in respiratory acidosis, it only changes by 3.5? If that's your question, I have two answers for that. The first answer is there is no answer. That's why. That's how we were constructed. And that's how mammals were constructed. So there is no teleologic answer. The second answer is they may be the same with the newer data I was telling you about from Medeas, where he reported patients, I think in addition to some Canadian data, where he showed in respiratory acidosis chronic, it's also 10 to 5, like the alkalosis. So, so that has still not been worked out, whether they are equal, and then your question would not apply because they are the same 10 to 5 for both versus if they it is really 10 to 3.5 for the acidosis then we're left with saying that's how we were constructed human brains have this or doctors have this word compensation and so it engenders this emotion of why aren't they equally compensated but that apply that implies a priori that the body is doing this to bring the ph back to normal and that is wishful thinking that you're taught in medical school and wishful thinking when the papers came out 30, 40, 50 years ago, calling it compensated. The word compensation is the problem because it implies to another human brain that the body's trying to bring the pH back to normal. But you, you, you need to know that as a renal fellow, that no one has ever proven that. No one has ever shown that these changes have the intent obviously biology doesn't have an intent evolution but but we should shouldn't superimpose this thought that there's an intent to bring the ph back to normal that is just something that's never been proven and that you have to rid your mind of as a renal fellow
And I know you were brought up with that in medical school and in residency that these these things are changing to bring the pH closer to normal, but that is just not true. And if an attending says that, you have to correct them. Unfortunately, you're going to keep hearing it over and over again. So that would be another thought with your question. But it isn't just that if they are different, that's how we're constructed. But that in the first place, these changes have nothing to do with bringing the with the intent to bring in the pH back to normal. They occur for other reasons, and I can get into that another time, some of which we understand, some of which we don't understand. And I'll show you I'll show you examples uh, as you get a little more sophisticated, where the pH, because of the changes, is actually made worse. Had the change not occurred, the pH would be better. Nick Medias showed that a number of years ago. Beautiful paper that we'll review. So I, I hope that sort of addresses some of the... Your question's a good one, but there are a lot of subtleties to the answer. Does anybody have any qu other questions? Okay, great. We'll have a great rest of the day, everybody. We'll meet again next week.